recording. So good morning, everyone. No matter how well we plan, there's always going to be something that pops up. If over the last year, if we have learned, learned nothing else, it's that we have to learn how to fly by the seat of our pants and be flexible. And a year ago, uh, we, would, uh, we wouldn't be where we are. People are joining now and are feeling confident about uh, coming into uh, the virtual environments. Um, and we know that there's going to be tech issues no matter what we do. So just letting that go, uh, here we go. And so I'm Deb Fitzgibbons, and it is my pleasure to welcome you uh, to one of our routines, uh, Wednesday mornings. If it's Wednesday during a school year, we are echoing. And today we are echo voicing and welcome you to this conversation that is really leans towards uh, our learners with complex communication needs, but it also brings in conversations that span all of our kids. Access is what we're talking about today and every day, and we all have a slice of that pie. So, uh, of course, as I said, I've turned on the closed captioning, and uh, I'm going to be posting a link uh, to the handouts once Chris gives me his handouts. Uh, gentle uh, reminder. And uh, Moving forward, uh, again, I am the coordinator of the Oregon Technology Access Program. Uh, we focus on assistive technology, uh, which includes augmentative communication. Uh, we talk about accessible educational materials. Um, we have a state cohort going right now that really focuses on that. We're putting together a, um, a statewide system of delivering accessible educational materials, uh, no matter where you are in our state. And so we're really beginning with common language and developing uh, ways for access. We know that your students, the ones that you're working with, um, need access to be able to communication, access to the community, access, um, and that's where we're beginning. And so Chris was just telling us, our guest today was just telling us how these are the conversations we're having here, but it makes sense and we're all on target because these are the conversations that are also being had at our national assistive technology um, events. So uh, we are pleased to bring you uh, more of that conversation. Uh, when I wing, I feel like I'm on my soapbox and I don't have my direction. So that's the beauty of having a presentation is that it keeps you focused. We all focus on our routines, and those are the, some of the things that we'll be talking about today. We have a, a statewide town hall meeting coming up on February the 22nd. I will be posting that. Uh, great conversations coming out of that. Um, our licensing boards and our uh, national organizations have been joining us. Great opportunities for uh, voice. Gail, do you have uh, your? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that's a statewide town hall for occupational therapists and physical therapists to talk about virtual services and stuff. It uh, is. I just, I, not everybody's familiar, so I just wanted to. Oh, well, that's right. That and they're not. And what it is is another way for us to bring the voices to the table. Uh, that uh, have questions about what is implemented and the policies at the state level uh, when it comes to the face-to-face -face with students, that's you all. And whenever you look at the practices and uh, the guidance, what are the questions? Well, this brings us with our questions to the people who we ask the questions of. And it's the, um, the housing or the health authorities. It's our our Medicaid folks, it's our licensing boards, and uh, it's really just becoming such a wonderful platform, and, and you'll see more of that. If you are receiving our notices, you will see more of the uh, town halls. Um, we are also uh, preparing for our annual conference. Um, it is virtual again. Uh, registration will, will be opening up uh, the, right around the middle of this month. We're putting together an amazing uh, conference and bringing together all of the pieces and parts uh, that make up accessible accessible environments 
whatever that environment is. And so our really our theme this year is starting to be uh, AT ties together, combination of our conferences, assistive technology and therapy and educational settings. We have so many things in common. We respect the differences and all the things that you bring to the table with your licensure uh, and then um, talk about the things that we all have in common. So this year, I would say that our secondary theme is focus on access. Through the life of our accessible educational materials, statewide focus and our cohort, we are going to, we are having conversation that brings everyone to the table. So we welcome you to participate and share our progress with us. We are looking at our next step. We have our statewide uh, group together. We're going to be looking at our districts and inviting our districts to come um, and work with us through the processes, bringing together the people in your district. We know that any team needs to involve our therapists and our uh, of all licensure. So yes, we're focused on OT and PT with our delivery of ECHO um, ties. In our delivery of support for therapists, we, we must have a focus on, um, on communication. So um, we, in a, and I put up a notice for our next sessions. Uh, Kelly Fawner is going to be back with us in our next um, ECHO Voices. Uh, she's going to be sharing some uh, pearls of wisdom uh, today. I am thrilled uh, to always co-facilitate with my friend Gail Bowser, who's my friend and partner in all of, a lot of these um, opportunities. We are doing things on a district level, on a state level, and on a national level uh, to the state leaders of uh, assistive technology and education. And so, Gail, uh, give us a shout out and tell us uh, what your passions are. Oh, wow. Uh, good morning, everybody. One of my passions is doing these ECHO uh, network sessions. I work for uh, Deb as a, as a consultant and a, a, I think it, just a helper. She's got so many ideas. We, uh, it takes more than one person to implement them all. But um, so Echo Voices, Echo Ties, and I also work for the University of Wyoming in doing an Echo and Assistive Technology Network. Um, I've got my, my brain in a lot of other activities, but that's probably the important one for today. Thanks for joining us today. Yes, and Gail, you're so right. And But what I'm finding in all of these conversations is that there are paths that just converge. And it seems like what we're doing is taking a big old ball of education and pulling it apart and see what pieces, so many pieces need to come together and we have an opportunity to do that. I love uh, that Linda Brown, uh, the um, liaison for both of my grants, our grants, uh, you say you work for me, Gail. That's not really true. You work for all of the people across the state because that's our mission. We are funded by ODE. Linda Brown, um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I know you didn't have your camera on. We know there's lots of reasons for that. Were you having breakfast? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad for that, but I would be uh, remiss if I did not always uh, welcome Linda. She is such an active a liaison with ODE in so many ways. Uh, Linda is also uh, the third member of our AIM cohort uh, statewide leadership team. And so we've got some great things going on. Uh, the fourth member is uh, Carla Wade. And Carla brings in the gen ed piece and the instructional technology, the distance learning. She has such a, um, a she brings in, you know, so many of our things come in the sped door. And then, okay, getting everybody on board with it. But I'm happy to say that Carla Wade um, is also going to be one of the keynotes uh, bringing that gen ed conversation at our conference coming up. So yay, good stuff. And thank you, Linda, always for your support. So I'm not gonna say anything more about the past other than it's a year ago, we were yucking it up at ATIA. 
and talking about the role that Chris Gibbons could play in, in professional development here. And those conversations keep going on. And Chris, um, I value that you wear so many hats that I can't even begin to say the things that you are involved in. Uh, but I know you have had a lot of experience with uh, working with university level here. Uh, when Gail and I were talking to Melanie Frito at the uh, university level and talking about a progression of our echo voices and somewhat curriculum, your name kept coming up there. So what we put for your, um, your description of who you are uh, says smart box, but you know what? That's an affiliation and you are going to tell us all of the hats that you wear and how they all come together in where you are today. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Thank makes you. sense to me. So um, uh, really what, what you were asking me to talk about today is something that we've all had to deal with uh, now for almost a year. One of our children just went back to part-time hybrid schooling this week. And we realized that she'd been out of school since the beginning of last March, which, uh, which signifies a time for all of us when things started to change uh, quite rapidly in terms of how we practice in the world, how we engage with the people that we are advocates for and, and who we have developed a professional um, toolbox with which to enable people to live independently and create opportunities. And, and so that has been a big adjustment for a lot of us and it's created a lot of conversation, but you know, out of that, we have the chance to create as much as we break down and do things differently that's sometimes uncomfortable. And so that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, there's kind of three themes that I thought I could push through with our time together. Uh, and and uh, we'll kind of work through these themes and then I've, I've put a little, uh, almost like a case example at the back that hopefully will just stimulate discussion amongst those of us uh, that are here. But Chris, do you things. prefer that people ask questions uh, as you go along or do you prefer that you present and then we uh, chime in with questions and answers? Oh, I think we should, we should make it as conversational as possible. So just You're unmute yourself. Yeah, just <laughs> unmute yourself and, and interrupt. And that I think is the best way to do it. And we will be monitoring the chat box. So uh, we always want to start with that. Uh, let it go, Chris. Sounds good. Yeah, because when I'm sharing my second screen here, I'm not seeing the chat. So thanks, thanks, Deb, for doing that. So there's these three themes that I think, uh, just a way to organize thinking. You know, one is, uh, why do we do what we do? Uh, I don't think that gets talked about enough in terms of what, um, uh, how the impact of change can affect us as professionals. And, and that ends up translating into, into the nuts and bolts of how we do our job. Uh, what virtual tools have been brought to bear? And I'm not gonna go in, this is not gonna be a how to use Zoom and model for uh, your client kind of a conversation. I think there's a lot of information out there on that right now that is extremely valuable uh, and, and very toolboxy. I'll bring up a couple of examples, but really more so to talk about what I see as a rotation of our perspective and, and, and how we can make what we're doing now advantageous far into the future, not just for right now. Uh, which gets to this third point, which has to do with opportunity. You know, how do we take what we've been given and, and make it uh, quite valuable and possibly even leapfrog clinically what uh, where we've been for a, a while. Uh, Deb was saying that, uh, you know, who's this guy, Chris? Well, uh, I know many of you that are here, but uh, also just know that I've, I've been a speech language pathologist for a long, long time at this point. Did my CFY up at OHSU after being in Nevada for a few years, getting my, my master's degree out of the way, went on to, to go ahead and, and do a research degree. And that's led to research from everything uh, from brain computer interface studies to uh, some educational opportunities and others. I currently work at Smartbox. Uh, and, um, and in the meantime, I have a family. And I always include this picture of my dog who was in the picture earlier, but is now gone. This is Posey. And she has a very long tongue. And as a speech language pathologist, I always have to point that out. I, I, I frequently refer to her as, the, as uh, a member of like a rock band, you know. 
because she has such a long tongue. I, I live in Oregon, actually, well, the Portland metro area. We're, we're literally just moved into Vancouver several years ago because my wife works in Salmon Creek. But I grew up in Tigard, if any of you know where that is, suburb of Portland. So we don't have hours today. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this condensed and, and work through a lot of just slides and information. And really, the point is to invite your comments. So as you think of things while we're going through this, I, I really welcome your thoughts. But the, the idea is here is that, you know, what does it mean from our perspective as speech language pathologists for those of us who do this for a living? Why do we do what we do? And how does that anchor our whole approach to clinicianship? And what does that mean when that approach changes from in-person to virtual? Um, what are the, some of those tools? What does that changing role mean in virtual versus an in-person environment? And what does that mean then for those long-term implications of how we may practice into the future and how I think those of us that continue to influence the field and the direction of the field translate into what we start to talk about as our professional role in people's lives. So I was thinking about this, you know, what, what does being a speech language pathologist or being an assistive technologist mean? And when we think about it, uh, it really is anchored for, I think most of us in personal connection. Uh, we might be out to change the world, but it's not because we're gonna become a huge excavator and move earth around on this little planet. It means that we're making personal connections with people over and over again in different ways that grows and has varying levels of influence. And sometimes it's making sure that that person gets from point A to point A point two. And other times it's because we engage with an individual and we get from all the way down the alphabet to, to you know, Q with that individual because we've either known them a long time or we can provide them with tools that just profoundly changes their experience of life. But the goal is to impact some positive change for them, however we define that. And that for those of us in the communication sector of all of this, there's, there's kind of a philosophical fascination with, with communication and how it changes us and how it enables us. So these are all motivations that underwrite why we do what we do, including the challenges. But always in that final thing that I, I put on there, which comes right to the first one, which is that joy of person to person interaction. We anchor what we do in science and theory, clinical best practice. Part of the connection that we have with people is because I think most of us anyway are really empathetic. And so we understand where people are. We're willing to put ourselves into that place because in order to work with that individual, we need to understand where they are so that we can, we can create, help them become uh, a different kind of individual when it comes to how they the opportunities that they have in the world, their ability to understand language or participate in communication, et cetera, et cetera. We're organizers. A big part of what we do is make a path for people. We explain how things work. Importantly, you've heard me say the word opportunity several times already. I believe very strongly that a, a huge role that we have as assistive technology uh, experts is to be the ones who identify where opportunities can be had for an individual and then make those opportunities real. And again, we work closely we have a personal connection. And, and that becomes the reason so often that we do what we're doing. So personal connection, positive change, empathy, working with teams, just like the team that, that Deb and Gail have gathered here today. Um, we are satisfied by that because that, that gives us a sense of accomplishment. I think all of us are philosophers in one sense or another. I think it's impossible to work with people who are outside the mean of how the way humans are prescribed to interact. Um, and this you know, happens. So as soon as we interact with people who don't fit into that bubble, we have to start asking some deep questions. Um, opportunity creators, there it is again, problem solvers, and we have a face-to-face -face impact. And when I was going around looking at, at uh, 
quotes from speech pathologists defining why they do what they do. I thought it was really interesting listening and then finding some of these on some blogs. I, I just want to read through these quickly. I get to play with toys on a regular basis. Well, that's, I love this because don't we all, you know, my garage is full of tools and things. This room behind me is full of toys. It's so rewarding to see a child's face when they say their name correctly for the first time. I feel like I'll never stop learning. I get to collaborate with other professionals. I get to combine medical knowledge with education. Flexibility, I can do so much with this profession. Thinking on my feet and coming up with new ideas on the spot is an adrenaline rush. And I think the one I love is the last one I've listed here, which is I laugh every day. And, you know, sometimes we laugh when we sit in the car after a, a, a consultation because we've cried, <laughs> but we laugh sometimes as just a release and sometimes out of sheer joy. And sometimes because we're sharing one of the moments like what has been listed here above um, with the people that we work with. Again, this, this level of connection is so much the reward. So the reason I bothered to just spend five or eight minutes talking about all that is because a lot of the things that we've just defined there, we conceptualize as occurring in a very personal environment, literally next to someone in a classroom or in a clinic room or at bedside or in home at a, at a, at a home you know, health visit or what have you. And somehow then we have to figure out a way that we can, as I say, rotate this to be still present, this, this sense of connectivity in a virtual environment. And, and what does that mean? So I've kind of tried to pull this into what I'm calling 10 changing expectations that we kind of need to wrap our heads around. One is that virtual therapy actually isn't new. Uh, we just haven't conceptualized it as the way we do what we do. We have, um, we have had the ability to, so when I was at the University of Oregon as a student in 1987, there was, um, there was this thing that was started to emerge called Telnet. You know, so it's like green screen technology that you could communicate with someone who was not in the same room. Yeah, Gail, remember, it's a, and there, that you could communicate, but you could actually end up writing over each other. So there were, there were rules to the communication and everything. That ushered in this new idea that we could, we could, we didn't call it texting, but we could we could text with people back and forth, even if they were somewhere else in the world. It was earth shattering or earth shattering at the time, but it quickly became common practice and now is very normal to us. The, my point here is that distance communication is something we're very familiar with. We just don't place it as the way we do business. The goals that we have for the therapeutic intervention we have or the goals for education don't necessarily need to change, but how we, how we exercise them will. Uh, we get caught up frequently in number three, as I've talked to a lot of people doing virtual therapy services of any kind, is that, oh, I just feel like it fails. Well, I, I mean, I'm sorry, but I, as a private practitioner for many years and working in many different environments, I've had plenty of bad therapy sessions. They just happen uh, and they'll happen virtually. We feel it differently because our expectation is different. We do need to prepare differently. We need to involve collaborators differently. And let me just get to the right screen here. There we go. And we need to listen to the home environment or whomever it is that we're dealing with differently. Now I'm gonna turn this around to be very positive. And, and I think that in number six in particular, it used to be that the students we would deal with in a classroom or in a therapy environment left that very scripted, contained, well-engineered space and went to this other place that we never saw, never interacted with. And we had we would infer a lot about based on the communication we had with their family and with that person. Maybe the clothes that they wore, the lunch that they brought to school or didn't bring to school every day or whatever it was, we made in inferences about what that environment might be like. But now we actually get to not just see where they live, 
we get to interact with where they live and make that a part of their functional uh, therapeutic environment. And this is something that is extremely powerful as clinicians that we've just never been able to bring to bear as a resource in our work with children before. I have a question for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as we look at that, you know, as to everything, there are two sides. Uh, we know that some kids are struggling in the home environment, and of course, we know that some are thriving. Um, when we think about the detail of that, being able to put just a simple um, background behind this uh, may be that, that point that makes the child feel more confident about being in their home. And I say that because, and, and I think you know, maybe you know where I'm going to, but there may be, kids may not wanna have their camera on because maybe what's behind them is not something they want other people to see. So when we think about the mindset of a family and a child coming to that environment, um, I know that a lot of people talk about engagement based on having your camera on or not. And uh, when we think about our kids, either helping the family to come up with a good background that can be used, that can relieve that, or uh, you know, uh, finding ways to make it okay to have your camera turned off uh, to reduce stress. And so that's another one of those in all of the conversations that I'm having, it seems like um, that's a piece that we need to talk about. I totally agree. Actually, that's a really important piece. And there's there are, so I, I'm gonna continue on your two-sided version of this, although maybe it's unfair to split it in two, but we'll do that for just the conversation. Yeah, I wasn't sure either, but take it and run with it, go ahead. So on the one hand, what we've experienced, and I spend a tremendous amount of time, even in my role currently with Smartbox, which is admittedly one dimensional because I'm working just with Smartbox stuff, but I, all of what I do is virtual as it is for all of us these days for the most part. And what we've found is I work with clinicians with whom I'm supporting as they're, as they're implementing assistive technology in an environment is that many of the folks who might otherwise have been either embarrassed on the one hand or or um, nervous about sharing their home environment. We've found that there is an opportunity to accept them where they are, accept their environment. I have my own messes. Um, and and it's there's been kind of this cumulative um, relaxation of expectation, okay? So that's one group and that's the best side. So that's the positive side. Getting to the other side that you're talking about, which is extremely important, um, is that there, there is a, a percentage of people who we have, who have frankly have been kind of left out because they're either, there's either great, a great deal of dysfunction in the home uh, or, um, or an unwillingness to acknowledge that dysfunction in a way that, that is going to be dealt with on any level. And those, so what we've found is that in some cases, we'll have uh, situations where, you know, the, 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 the treating clinicians on, on one side of Zoom, I'm on the other side, the caregiver or, or person is, is on, on the other side of the Zoom call. And we, there's always a, a background that we never ever see. And that is, um, uh, that does not allow us to get to the positive side of what I'm getting at. So I, I'm, I'm acknowledging what you're saying, Deb, I'm not sure there's an easy answer for it because we can't force ourselves into that. But what we can do in many instances is, is allow people to be who they are, where they are and accept that readily. Um, and, and many times that is that does turn out to be quite functional. Well, and it seems to me that the, that group that you're talking about um, have been left out forever, um, not just in virtual services. That they, mm -hmm. they're just left out visually right now. Um, so, it, for the most part, I I believe that's true. Yeah, yeah, and they're a group that that we um, are in all likelihood better able to serve even if it is marginal in person when they are in a in-person school environment because we're actually capturing them there. They, they're, um, so they, they don't get it, the positive side of, of what I'm trying to present here. So it's a good point. There's one last thing I wanna say about that is, you know, I know a lot of people are saying when we're back in the uh, 
school environment when we're face to face. But I think that all of us can see a case for keeping this as an option, the virtual piece. And you know, it could change how we do our orientations with families and making sure that there's always this type of a component. And you know, doing that face to face when we can, uh, but then being able to prepare for uh, extension of our services, uh, no matter what the world looks like. To totally agree. I actually, I, I will make that argument as strongly as I can uh, later in this in this. Okay. Session. Well, I'm going to let you do your presentation here because that's why I invited you. That's why we invited you because of, we're of like mind and it's all good stuff. So. Thank you. Nope, that's great. Thank you for bringing that point up, though. That's really, really important. All right, go forward, sir. No worries. So uh, off the back of that, and related actually to your, your point, Deb, is that we do have the opportunity now to teach parents and siblings and caregivers what we do. I, I think one of the, the, the black box that I refer to as the home environment for many people, um, the other side of that coin is that we've presented ourselves as a bit of a um, clinical expert and a black box to our clients. And we have kind of our secrets of why we're doing what we're doing that are in our head and the theory behind what we do. And I will argue that one of the things that we've been given the opportunity to do is teach parents, siblings, and caregivers why we do what we do so that they better understand it. And then we can see that carry over in the home environment more effectively. That, that is part of number eight, which is we teach why not just how. Uh, we can explore new therapy and reinforcement techniques. We can encourage, have fun, and enjoy personal connection just differently than being in the same room and literally throwing the same bean bag that the kid has thrown into the bucket, um, which is very joyful, but that's just not the way the world works right now. Okay, so then where does this take us? So one of the things that I think has been reinforced over and over again is that uh, you know, some of us are very type A and, and, and prepare everything, and some of us aren't, and we're all flying by the seat of our pants, you know. There's room for everybody here. But one of the things that we have learned is that the more that we get set up beforehand, the better. And that's not always how we've done our clinical work anyway, as speech pathologists. We, we, we have someone join us in a clinic room. We have an intake sheet, maybe, or a questionnaire, but we do our evaluation kind of there on the spot. It's a little different when we're working remotely and we get the basics down. Who's going to be the technology person? Do they have an extra device sitting around so that we can watch them doing what we want them to do, especially uh, in the world of AAC? Um, and is there a way, are they capable of having a Google Doc back and forth so that we can quickly answer questions or keep a running record of goals together where they can take notes that we can see and add to? These are all just basics. There's many more, but my point is that this level of, of prepara uh, preparation is important. And I think for us, feeling confident in a virtual environment, the more prepared we are, the more we know about what we're gonna walk into, the more we're gonna be able to experience that as if we were coming into a session with our clipboard and where we're the ones that are going to direct the environment, you know, and there's the kid that we're ushering into the, the therapy room, and we kind of know what we're doing, we know where our toys are. The more we know about what that environment has to offer, the less we're going to be there um, just kind of figuring things out and looking like we don't know what we're doing because maybe we really don't. Okay, so, uh, which means setting up expectations. So I've listed some things. And by the way, Deb, the, the notes that I'll share, I'll just share this. PowerPoint slide with you so that you can make it available to everyone because it really has all of the information that we're talking about. And there's some things that I'm not taking the time to go through fully, but they're listed here. I just think they're points that, that I've found to be valuable. Um, but these are just, these are basics that we don't always think about that are almost like a checklist as we're, as we're getting prepared for, for a virtual interaction. Is there a place that they're, they're going to be seat, seated? Is it you're going to be a place where they have ready access to Wi-Fi. It's not in the garage. Um, find out what the family already does to support the goals for communication. I communicate with families uh, most of the time in advance of the Zoom settings that we, or the Zoom 
sessions that we have set up when we are implementing new technology in a, in a household. And I ask the parents or the caregivers and I say, well, what is the, you know, what does a person like to do? Where do they sit usually? Oh, they, they like these songs or they're really into, God, what was the one yesterday? Um, something teen musical. What's that? What is it? high school musical? So uh, made sure that there were some links, some, some links on YouTube to high school musical that I'd already had queued up through a button in, in grid software so that we were ready for that, you know? So these are things that we were ready to just engage with before the session even began. My point though with that is the second to the last item here. We don't get the privilege in some ways, but we're also not um, encapsulated or, or tethered to this idea that we create the clinical context that the child walks into. We engineer the whole environment for a specific goal and then we implement that procedure. Now we are going to apply goals to a natural context. And this is actually what we do in child rearing uh, for the most part, sometimes with more or less success. But in a therapeutic environment, we have an opportunity to take some very well thought through, very concise goals and apply them to a natural context. But if we don't know the natural context, if we haven't asked what that is or followed the family around with their phone to know where what they do on a daily basis, then uh, we it'll be harder to do that. I, I use the example here of, of, you know, grandma is visiting and making cookies in the kitchen. What an awesome place or awesome environment or context in which to have an AAC system or a low tech bo communication board to choose shapes for the cookie patterns, colors for the sprinkles, to talk about um, whose turn it is to do something like stir the, the batter, or it's my turn to put some dough on the board, or the board, on the, on the cookie sheet or whatever it is that we're, we're doing. To identify specific tools that are used in that environment with grandma. And guess what? It teaches grandma how to use AAC and model with that person in the most meaningful, natural, fun, way where you're probably going to end up with flour on your nose at some point. And I mean, that is, that is a much more rewarding environment than me trying to entertain for 38 minutes the client or the student through a screen where maybe I've got some drawing activity or I'm trying frantically to move my mouse around uh, and make squigglies on the screen to keep them visually attentive to what's happening. Uh, there's there's room I have a comment from someone here, Chris. They say, as a home visitor, I have to join in whatever routine is happening in the home at the time and uh, of the visit. And so it's a very powerful way to coach the family. So yes. when we look at the uh, service models that we have, people joining from all over our state, we have a lot of different roles. So thank you for that perspective. It, this is what you're part of all the time. It, yeah helping them to adapt and, and find ways to communicate at home. So. Well, and I think the big, so one of the big challenges we've had professionally forever is how do we take the goals that we've identified that we feel, so what is a goal? What is a goal that we come up with therapeutically or educationally? We're looking for the biggest bang for the buck, the highest impact that we can make in that person's life to step them up in their performance in a particular area, whether that's uh, language understanding, whether it is mathematics, whether, whether it is social pragmatic skills, whether it is their ability to link a couple of items on a dynamic display AAC system, we're saying we're ignoring all these other things that I think would help you because these are the ones, these are the specific goals that are going to give us a big bang for the buck. But the challenge we've always had after we've identified those is to say, I can make it happen here, but I have no idea what happens anywhere else in the world or in this child's life. What we have now is the opportunity, just as identified by the person who commented, to say, I now know what this person's doing. Not only can I see places to do that that are meaningful in that person's life, but I can engage with the people who are most meaningful to that person. Well, to, and if the family is talking about an upcoming family reunion, well, then being able to practice and say, what would you like to say? And do some role playing and, and you know, even bring a family member in to 
uh, to help with that. They're just it just opens up a whole world. It does. You know, who's going to be there? Be there? You, you have a have a message about making sure that Uncle Jerry wears a mask, you know, or whatever. I mean, there's like there's all these things that that could be uh, fun and engaging and and uh, and what's your favorite food is always a good conversation. What should we take? Agreed. Totally agree. <laughs> so again, uh, in teaching, what we're doing is we're saying uh, uh, or engaging people in the environment. We're also giving them the tools that we would otherwise be the ones that kind of hold as our own. You know, we talk a lot about modeling these days and modeling with purpose. And um, now we get the chance to actually not just define what modeling is to a family member. And I give an example here. Modeling is when I show how to say words using this communication device the way I want Joey to use it. Because I'm not there. So I'm saying that to the family. I can give my example on Zoom and share my screen and everything. But they need to understand why we're doing that. They can practice. We, like I've said earlier, we can follow them around their house. And if it's a TV program, show them how to model requesting that TV program or commenting on it. Uh, and then did teaching all these. Up? Yep. Dale, did you have a hand up? Okay. Go ahead. So again, uh, make everything in the room relevant, just like I was saying with the example of the baking exercise. Uh, I really think it's important not to keep uh, clinical secrets. Nothing we do is a mystery and nothing that we have that we do should be mysterious. Um, we're basing our intervention on, on solid theory that is empirically informed and clinical best practice and our clinicianship, which is based on our, our years of experience or what have you with uh, other people. And the more that we open up what we do and explain it to people, the more it draws them in and un they understand what we know. I also think it challenges us to continue to learn and know more. And I think that that's a really important part of what we do too. And if you remember all the way back at the beginning of this, one of the things that people listed as being great about speech pathology in general, but I'll say in education in general, is that we're always learning. And one of the reasons we're always learning is that we're constantly challenged to learn more. Uh, something I haven't really said explicitly yet, but is harder sometimes virtually is to be inspiring and goofy and weird and surprising. And I think that as, mu as much as we can model that in a session and be real, and you know, I have my, my boxes and packing material around because this is a real environment and there's an iron and an ironing board behind me. We, we can relax ourselves a little bit to make sure that the folks that we're dealing with feel relaxed and they get to be free and funny too and know that it's not just a regimented set of demanded tasks that they're gonna to have to endure while we're on this Zoom call together. By the way, we also know that humans learn by having fun. Humans learn when they're engaged in something that is meaningful. And so for almost all children, it has to do with fun and humor and goofiness. So in kind of getting to this point of how do I do what I do now uh, and be the professional I wanna be, and, and again, rotating the conversation around what, how does this change what we all do as professionals? Um, we have different expectations. We're, we're teaching trust by being open about what we do. We teach the why, not just the how. We provide positive feedback still, make it easy for the family to support uh, their, their student far beyond when we leave. Because hopefully if we've sat next to the TV on a beanbag with them virtually, and we've, we've given them ways to model commenting on the TV show or being able to tell their younger sibling who keeps running up and changing the channel not to do that anymore in a fun way, they're gonna use that into the future in that environment because they've already told us this is what they do. There's a great um, 
I was talking to a colleague up in Seattle uh, a few weeks ago, and she said, what I always ask families is, I always ask them, what would you be doing right now if we weren't having this session? And she said, it's a totally innocuous statement. And I do it just as a question. And they'll say, oh, well, this is usually when, you know, um, well, we've usually fed the dog because it's fairly early in the morning. And then we we take a walk around the block, you know, afterward to do our poop loop, you know, or whatever it is. So perfect. That is a great, that has just given a window onto their daily activities that we can then use as examples uh, for modeling and ways to show them how to use, in this case, AAC with that student. And if we show them that way, they're not gonna have trouble generalizing it to their environment because we've already done that. We've leapfrogged what we would otherwise have to do. So in person, we're responsible for directly Im impacting the state of our client. Virtually, we also are responsible for the people who are responsible for our client. And I would argue this is, this is actually almost paramount. You know, our first job, define the goals. What is it that we're trying to accomplish for this individual? Define the opportunities we're trying to open up. Opportunities for cognitive growth, language growth, et cetera. But really we're teaching the environment as much as we're teaching that person. And I say, well, then isn't this what we've always wanted? Because when I was way back in graduate school, that's all we talked about was teaching the environment. And there were books written on teaching the environment that we read, but that we have been forever, I would submit, um, somewhat uh, sort of handcuffed by actually achieving because our, our, our clinical paradigm has always been, I don't mean, I'm not, I'm not unfairly bashing a pullout mentality and I don't mean that because there are times when it's extremely important and, and very, very valuable. That's not actually what I'm getting at, but there's, it's more of a mentality than it is how we do it sometimes. We could still pull a kid out of a classroom and interact with them, but what we've learned from this experience of virtual clinicianship is that uh, how we do that, and maybe to your point, Deb, you said earlier about, well, maybe we keep doing this to some degree, or Gail, maybe you, you were mentioning, I'm, I apologize for who brought that up, but, but maybe we're gonna continue doing both when we're finally back in school again. And we say, no, actually, uh, of the twice a week that I see this kid, 20 minutes is going to be in the classroom. 20 minutes is going to be uh, a virtual environment because that's how we're actually going to achieve the, the clinical goals that we want to achieve, the intervention goals, overarching intervention goals we want to achieve with a student. Okay, so uh, the implications I want to get to is virtual therapy can teach us to be better therapists. We can more effectively apply professional skills because we are actually treating the environment. And we have been given this opportunity, I think for many of us for the first time to really engage with our uh, caregivers and parents in ways that we've never been able to before. And I think um, the, the relationship in terms of the trusting relationship, the informal degree of communication that we can have with the parents uh, and meaningful, I mean by that, uh, is actually far accelerated uh, beyond where, where it was for many of the folks we deal with prior to this virtual environment. So, okay, so that is an encapsulation. I hope I didn't run over my time too much, Deb. I assume you were watching the clock, but... Uh, uh, I was, but then again, not because I was enthralled with what you were saying. You know, when we first started talking about what your focus would be, we knew that uh, best practices would start emerging in teletherapy and OGCOM, and that's kind of where we went. But whenever I hear what you're saying, it really goes beyond that. And, you know, Gail and I were chatting amongst ourselves here saying, you know, this needs to be a general session uh, because uh, in, in preparing, and I, I just think your message today uh, was awesome. Uh, and I know that word is overused, but I'm also thinking when we look at our conference, I think I've had you mark the dates out, but I do think this is a message that goes beyond all uh, common teletherapy. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to participate on any level. Okay, y'all heard that. He just committed. 
Right. <laughs> <laughs> but Signature it is, to come later. It, it's very meaningful. And again, it's, it's you're speaking to, uh, we're speaking about the kids who are often left out. And uh, when we think about uh, our kids with so-called normal communication, uh, we walk around and we keep saying these things and we repeat them and those things that it, that it takes to learn to communicate. And as soon as families have a difficulty in uh, knowing that their message is being heard um, because it's hard to uh, interpret what could be communication, it, we are at a loss to know how we're going to support. And so as clinicians, that happens. And, uh, and of course, as families, uh, just developing some of these routines and making sure that that focus is there can be life altering and, and even in the dynamics of the family. So um, just that. And Gail has her hand up, but we're going to uh, leave it open for others to ask questions, make comments, but also talking about real life application. Gail, what you got? Oh, I was that actually going to say that. I would love to hear Christian messages is um, amazing. I'd love to hear from some other people um, some of the uh, unanticipated outcomes that they've seen in their own therapy from um, from doing virtual work, especially with kids with augmented communication. We've had uh, a few people in the chat box. But um, I have loved your focus on family participation. So type in the chat box if you want or unmute yourself if you'd rather. <laughs> That's always a risk when you, do, when you invite people to, <laughs> to do that. Here we go. Rosanna, I have to go. Oh, she's just saying thank you. She's going to go do her job. And thank you for doing that job, Rosanna. It's always great to see you join us. Uh, we know you're always looking for ways to improve your practice, but we know you're already doing great things. Go you know, she, she said, uh, I've really improved my practice in the family coaching piece. Um, it's hard but it's really important. I wanted to say that too, even as a, as a consultant, this virtual environment has really given me an opportunity to, uh, to, to do things in new ways that empower people. I really see the people I work with being more, more powerful in their own work because of this environment. Absolutely, and I see Margaret has her hand up. Margaret, a frequent, uh, flyer with us. Great to see you. Hello. Yes, I do uh, uh, early intervention and so mostly with low tech and I've been really pleased with how when I have a copy of the low tech pictures and the family has a copy, uh, we've been able to do the dual exchange and then the other siblings often jump in. So we end up getting unusual and unexpected uses of the low tech options, which is a blessing because we want it to generalize everywhere. And um, I now know that every virtual visit is going to be very unplanned un for, or actually you plan, but you don't know what to expect. And you really do get to fly by the seat of your pants. So if you're that kind of therapist, this is your venue. <laughs> and I want to try to make an acronym somehow that works out of the fly by the seat of your pants, because that's a comment that I've used for years uh, and a lot of people are finding that's the way to go uh, right now. And uh, thank you for that, Margaret. Uh, Margaret, I was in a session um, about uh, a month and a half ago with a person who happened to be in the Seattle area, but they were using a, um, they were using a communication device on a rolling mount at home. And the, the, student who none of us had ever seen out of her power mobility at home spends very little time in power mobility. So there had been this whole orchestration of how things were going to be implemented and, and goals for an event, all this stuff based around the position of this person in a chair with the device mounted. Well, at home, the parents were struggling with how to get this rolling mount into the right position to 
so that she could see it because she spends a lot of her time on the couch, kind of slumped to one side where she's comfortable, or she'll slide down onto the floor and they have a series of mats and pillows and things they put behind her. Couldn't figure out how to get things. We were, they were confused about them. An older sibling came in, uh, teenager, young teenager, probably 12, 13, and started manipulating the mound, ended up lowering everything down so that it looked almost like, an, a, uh, like a giraffe neck you know, instead of sitting the way we all see it as convention, you know, must be in this position and had it to where it worked perfectly with her at an angle, kind of coming into the side of the, the couch. And that was, that was all the sibling who, frankly, I think we would have just struggled or said, well, this isn't really gonna work, you know? So there's that level of input that I think is just incredibly valuable too, because it truly becomes a family effort. And I am willing to bet that that sibling now is engaged with their younger sibling uh, who was uh, born with cerebral palsy now in ways that they, they weren't, it was a connection for them. So that'll, that'll live lifelong also. So a lot of, I think, collateral that is really positive uh, that can come to be brought to bear. I think that there um, is still opportunity for people to join in, but what I want to say is let's go ahead and talk about an individual and, and um, bring us with a case study of sorts. One component of, con of, of solidifying what you just talked about, making it real. Sure, absolutely. Well, let me just, um, let me just do something here and... I will set the stage just a little bit. Um, and let me quickly get through this because at the end I have a little, just a case outline um, of just a couple slides, no more, just for give us something to talk about more than anything, but a real example. So eight year old student, um, who is in totally remote learning, diagnosed with, with ASD, ambulatory, but with moderate discoordination, and, you know, uses a, a, a tablet style communication system and uh, on, a, on like a strap around the, their neck that they, they walk with. Uh, unintelligible except for a few kind of stereotyped um, single word utterances and uses an iPad with some grid software on it, just making some some basic choices about what's going on and to encourage dyadic turn taking. So uh, in this case, maybe uh, 12 or 16 messages on a page that are uh, that there aren't too many layers to. So it's mostly, uh, there's a choices page, there's a, a social page. So uh, just to reinforce the themes that I, I covered, there, there is not a sterile therapeutic environment in which this person arrives that I then sit across a table from or sit next to on a, on a chair and model for. And I think importantly, again, it's not that those of us that, that are capable of being entertainers for 40, 45 minutes at a time and completely engaging a kid, uh, there, that is a hard thing to let go of in virtual therapy because we want so badly to do that still. And we maybe derive a lot of joy from that. Uh, but again, it, it has not been proven to translate well in a virtual environment because we're not the environment. We are merely a, uh, a 12 or 14 inch image in their overall environment. And so instead we need to project out of that a set, uh, uh, we need to use that really as a sort of a big eyeball. And as we were discussing earlier, just soak in as much of the environment that's there as possible and really direct traffic more than we are going to be some uh, overbearing presence in the room that pulls that person in to a, a therapeutic activity. And it's just a different perspective. 
uh, obviously there are exceptions to this, by the way, but I'm, I'm giving this as general comments. So uh, the teaching role that we have then in that environment with this kiddo is to, uh, I've reiterated what I learned from this clinician uh, a few weeks ago in that, you know, what would the student be doing now if we weren't having this therapeutic interaction? I, I always try to have either a phone available as a, as a secondary device or some other way to see, because one of the things I didn't mention earlier, but I, I meant to is that it is incredibly informative to have a second video that observes the child observing you <laughs> in that screen. And it's one of the way, the reason that I say what I did earlier about, you know, we have to use our presence in the room as an eyeball looking out and observing rather than being the focus of the entertainment. Because unless we're being really entertaining or unless we have a certain kid who's just really into watching us, most of the time when you're watching them interact with you on Zoom, they're reacting to all kinds of things around their environment. And again, you know, dog rushing in and out, cat, other siblings, um, someone cooking in the, in the kitchen behind them. And those are oftentimes more important visually than us on that little screen, but we can use that to our advantage. So anyway, uh, in this case, uh, then let's just say that the, the kid, uh, well, I'll use the example I used earlier. This, this kid really wants to listen to uh, songs or watch little snippets of video from high school musical. Well, so, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have on their communication system, I will either remote edit that, which you can do with a lot of different AAC software so that they've got the messages to pick some specific songs from High School Musical, or I will ideally have the parent or caregiver teach them how to do that. That's part of my session. While the kid is off playing and doing something else, I'm interacting with the parent to teach them how to use this and program a couple of buttons which they then feel more comfortable doing in the future. And, and sitting with that extra camera next to them in the room and instructing the parent how to model, to change the different uh, songs, and then to engage that child so that the child can be the one picking those different songs as one of the, as one of the activities in that session. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there that I just tagged that little case example as an as a concrete example to the end. So it gave some context for the, the things that I was talking about. Welcome comments on that, by the way. Hi, Chris. My name is Joan Medlin. I'm not a speech path. I'm a dietitian and I'm a mom who has a kid with um, who uses assistive tech a lot and he's old. So just so you know, um, but I'm really enjoying this conversation an awful lot. I use these kinds of tools in helping families develop wellness and healthy lives. And I just wanted to say that, that um, the more you can encourage parents to remember those suggestions you make about sitting down with them and sharing time and singing a song, to just do it like they would with any other child, rather than Wait. thinking of it as therapy, would be a really useful thing because I think we tend to think every moment that we do that one-on-one -on -one with our own kid has to have this big payback. And, and we need to remember that just time and shared space is a big part of communication. That's excellent. Do you mind if I quote you on that in the future? Feel free. Thank I'm not you. sure I could repeat it if I tried. No, that came out really nicely. I like that. So it's an extremely important point. I think, uh, again, I, I would, it, it just, so part of this distinction between, for those of us that, that um, have been so used to sitting in a well-engineered clinical environment is that when we look at the goals and the data that we're keeping as we, as we make ticks on a page or on our iPad or whatever it is that we're doing is we're watching the behavior of this person, we hang on every opportunity to have these really high value moments of success or 
challenge and we're recording that so that we can adapt what we're doing constantly. And I think your point is very well made in that we're, we're uh, our, our goal in this is, is it's a larger arc of impact, which might mean that those individual moments of impact aren't as uh, sparkly um, in the clinical sense, you know? So, uh, so thank you for that. You know, Chris, I'm a teacher by training. So I just switched from whatever track I was on thinking to thinking about applying that same idea in classroom settings. I mean, we've, we've talked about the value of pull out and the value of integrated therapies, but, um, but I think that idea that that every moment doesn't have to be sparkly, but that you have to um, look for opportunities and, and take advantage of the opportunities is hopefully will be helpful as we return to face-to-face uh, -face school or mm -hmm. virtual mm -hmm. environments um, in, our, in our work with trying to team, helping teachers to understand how to do good AAC. Has anyone had an experience yet with hybrid learning with any of the students that they interact with? Or are we still too early that, that schools that you're working with have, have not gone back to hybrid yet? Invite people to join in, but right now uh, from the meetings and pieces and parts I've been getting that we're all over the place. Okay, okay. You know, I'm just curious. Yeah, I'm just curious if what Gail brings up has come to play for people who are entering into a hybrid learning environment where they're they're taking what they've learned from virtual and applying it either to classroom or um, or continuing to see the value in both. Well, you know, I, one thing I want to say is that some places uh, people who aren't part of the daily cohort aren't being allowed back in school, um, so you may end up having, rather than a, a, a home setting on the screen, you may up have, end up having a classroom setting on the screen. So it seems like those kinds of things will apply a lot. I've, uh, I don't know specifics in Oregon, but I've talked to people all over the country who are saying my services are all still virtual, even though the kids are back Yeah. Um, for health and safety reasons. So. You know, I'm having a conversation with somebody right now who is an AT person who has somebody who is homebound and they're looking at how to bring this person into the classroom uh, going back. But, you know, I think that the options are so, so much more readily available right now that, you know, if you, you still have to worry about getting kids images and the, their voices on recording. So, you know, that whole interactivity piece is a little challenging. Uh, you know, we used to be able to use the Kubi um, and the child at home is able to then move the camera to see what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. Some of our uh, teleconference cameras, I mean, they're just different, different aspects of, of what that can look like. And so in working with this person, we, I mean, I love being able to problem solve on that individual basis. Um, but these conversations are being had and hopefully we can come up with some best practices out of that. So, uh, you know, I know we have just a little bit of time left, uh, but one thing that Margaret said that I love is that one of the families that she works with projects her onto a big screen TV. And huh. She's a member of the family in the living room. And the parents are moving with the center of her as a part of the communication. And I love that. And it reminds me of, when I was living in Southern Illinois when my grand, granddaughter was in Oregon. Now I'm here and I don't have to do it virtually, but we used to have, like they would in the summer, we'd have a, they'd have a, a backyard picnic and I would be propped up at the end of the table. And you know the only thing they couldn't do was uh, pass me the bread um, but I mean, those are the kind of things that we can do now and, and bringing others in. So I love that. Just have me as a person sitting at your uh, table. Um, you know, I had a 
um, a baby shower for my daughter-in-law virtually. And I was able to uh, share the recipes of what I was going to serve in Illinois um, it, with them. So they were able to serve it in Oregon. You know, there's fun ways that you can do, make sure that the snack is there. But I love that, being a person propped up at the end of the table. Yeah, I think that's, that's brilliant. So great stuff to think about again. It just, you know, it's not just talking about teletherapy, it's talking about the new way that we work with our families. And, you know, you all have the skills. You work with these uh, folks in the most intimate settings. And right now, what that looks like is a challenge. But again, coming up with the ways to keep things engaging and flipping it so that you're not the entertainment, you're a person who's part of their own life and helping them find ways and connecting with families. I, I just love it. I yep. love the conversation. And, and Chris, as you said, you're going to send me those handouts and I'm going to post them because it is such meaningful conversation. I uh, don't think that you're going to get away without uh, uh, coming up with a time for you to do a general session at our conference. I'm so excited about that and the ability to put together um, the professional development when people need. We've been doing, this is our third year of Echo Times, our second for Echo Voices. Uh, last year when we had to all of a sudden flip our conference from face-to-face uh, uh, -to, -face to virtual, we did it with about three weeks time. Uh, and this year we got a little bit of a notice. We just decided not to bite our nails in the event that April wasn't going to bring us face to face again. Uh, but the opportunity to bring somebody in for a session or two when you don't have to pay for their lodging and all of the it just really gives you some versatility on what you can do. And so join us all as this big piece that is known as our conference comes together and we share that with you. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Kelly Fawn is going to be with us in a couple of weeks. Uh, next week at our Echo Kai session on Wednesday, we're going to be uh, hearing all about uh, supporting kids who are deafblind and looking forward to that, uh, some of the nuances in both worlds. And after that, I know we have a session from in our Echo Ties that is, uh, is talking about kids with CVI cortical visual impairment. I know we here in Oregon have a new person who's over that, um, brand new. And we've been talking to Scott Wall at the state level uh, of vision, um, but he is also now going to be focusing with this brand new person in a couple of weeks. So some amazing things happening out of these conversations. It's exciting. Uh, if, I, if nothing else, you can see my passion for this topic because I can't stop talking but I'm going to now because our time is up. Share with us what you need, what you want, how we can support you and be part of the community. Thank you all for doing what you do and we'll see you over here soon. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Susan. Yep. It's so much, uh, such a pleasure for your smooth style and your expertise that brings so many wonderful years of experience uh, right here to us, right here and now. Deb, do you have five minutes? I have more than that. I don't, but I want to well, ask okay. well, let's say goodbye to everybody for now. Right. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care, all. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, all. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dana.